Hey, this is Östen from Bokna. You're listening to What's Metal. Okay, uh, Östen, it's great to have you on the show again. We just revisited history, right? So the last time, with an interview at least, was probably 97 or 98, yeah? So uh, we have to rectify this. Uh, so for today, actually, Uh, you know, I, I don't want to talk too much about all the kind of like details for the current album or the previous album and so on. Rather, I'd like to kind of like revisit the discography as a whole. So we just go through the long players and um, maybe you can reflect a little bit on them. And then afterwards, obviously, we're going to play a couple of songs as well, right? Yeah. So maybe we start um, with, with the self-titled uh, debut. I think it came out on, was it Malicious Records back, back then from Germany? So if you look back at that, what, what kind of time was that back then and uh, how, how did this all come together? I know that you played in, was Molested before, yeah, we covered that last time around, so we don't have to go into that detail, but uh, maybe give us your impression. Well, what can I say? It's, it's a long time ago. It's almost like another life in so many ways. Uh, it was adventurous. It was almost like a fairy tale looking back on it now. Um, you know, I was young, 19, 18, 17 years. I think it was even six and 17 when I started to, you know, play around with the idea about the band and, you know, gathering, you know, riffs kind of in a, in a very early stage. And I got a logo from, from this Christophe, uh, the Lord of Logos. Um, And, and I, I spent quite some time uh, as a kid, basically, trying to you know, find, f find my expression in a sense, which, which later on became uh, the self-titled and the first album released by Malicious Records in 96, it was, I think, in, in late 96 or something. So yeah, it was, a, it was a crazy time in so many ways, so, and, and a glorious time in so many ways. I mean, with everything at back then was what can I say, analog, it was organic, it was no, you know, we didn't have any mail or, or, or you know, we, we had to talk about music, we, we hang around on pubs in Bergen, it was a small, small scene and, you know, we uh, kind of bragging about music and new ideas and new lyrical themes or whatever it was, and it was all about, you know, from mouth to mouth in, in a sense. And, and um, that was... Uh, what can I say? It was kind of mysterious and, 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 and uh, just a different way it was more mystique around the whole thing even even the local scene you know because yeah, yeah some some bands in, in Bergen at that time yeah had a new demo but, but none of none of us have heard about it or heard it yet because you know you actually needed to get the tape to listen to it and you have to get get home to have a cassette player to play it you know you couldn't just just flip your phone and show the cover and a logo and, and play off some songs you know so You know, that was also so different times, but so great times in a way, because it, it, I think it made, you know, the long runners like us, uh, all this like us that still are going on, it's like it made out hard skinned in a sense. We, we, we had to go the long, long way to make it, you know, make it happen. I, I started playing guitar and make music like I was when I was like 15 or 16 years old, I think. Very kind of determined to do something, be serious. I've always been that in my life. Whatever I do, I'm that serious about it. No, nothing stops me. So, so I, you know, I, as you mentioned, I had molested before that. And doing that, I, I kind of got somehow the, the underground-ish tape trading connections at, or network all over the world. So I kind of build on that in, you know, all the contacts I had at that time. And, I just pushed on making music and, and uh, there was no limits, you know, there was um, just, I was thinking music 24-7 at that time. Uh, I was always so into the whole thing and to be quite honest, I think you had to do that back then to be able to, to succeed somehow, to, 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 to cut through the, the scene and to make um, people notice you because, you know, it, there was was no way around there was no easy solution no quick fix you you couldn't you know uh, surf on a, a, a successful video on YouTube or anything like that on Netflix no Netflix but um, Spotify or you know you had to make it the old way and and that was a different game I would say and and gave me a lot as a musician and and I think that is um, I made a foundation back then which have made me going on for all these years You know, the music business is ups and downs. It's, it's tough sometimes. Other times, like today and tonight, it's great, awesome, you know, play a show in front of people and all that. But there's also a lot of, you know, heavy burdens. You have to do sacrifices, priority regarding, you know, family and whatnot, uh, girlfriends and stuff. So, so it, it, um, 
it was tougher, I would say, back then in many ways. But but if you made it, you kind of had a foundation that is, I would say, much stronger than than you might get today as a young band. Let me pick up one thing that you mentioned, which was that even in the local scene in Bergen, you had to dig for for the demo tapes that you haven't listened to yet. So how then? comes the connection to Malicious Records, who, who, who operated from, from not too far away from here actually in Stuttgart. Um, because back then actually they sent us a promo for the first album back then. And I remember the info sheet said uh, that they distributed 300 copies as promo. Yeah? And, uh, back then we felt kind of like humble to receive it. Yeah? And it was noticeably different. So, so how did that link come with, with Malicious Records? Well, well, that was kind of a weird story, or not weird, kind of uh, almost too mundane in a sense. I remember we, at that time, we lived in Bergen, uh, like like the a part of Bergen that is kind of Sandviken, it's called, and and close by, pretty much my neighbor was was Infernus from Gorgoroth. He li lived just up the street, and we was hanging a lot together at that time, drinking wine and you know uh, sharing a dinner. And he came visiting me and my my no wife and. I visited him, and he had late evenings, and, and you know had uh, listening music, drinking wine, especially a lot of wine at that time. I remember. Um, and I remember just we we I don't know after a couple of rehearsals, we had some songs on rehearsal tape recorded on the rehearsal. We we kind of felt that okay, we have something going here. And I remember um, and came <laughs> for a dinner, uh, like late evening or something, or a Sunday or something like that. And, and we just talked about, yeah, we should release this as an album and go to the studio and, you know, get the funds and all that to, to make an album, actually, to realize the album. And he was just, yeah, let me call Garrett at Malicious Records. And I was like, oh, shit, yeah, yeah, whatever. And, you know, at that time, it was expensive to call, you know, abroad with a landline, like, like 10, you know, one euro a minute or something like that. So I was like, yeah, but make it short, Roger. And he, he disappeared for because we had a phone on another room, I remember. And he made a call. And he came back in a, ten minutes or something like that, and, a, and, a, <laughs> and a, ten minutes after that, we got a fax from Malicious Record with a, you know, with an offer from him and you know budget. And I don't remember the details, of course, but all was it was easy, do, easy, easy business. And, and I got the contract, and we signed the contract, and that's it, basically. We did the album. Yeah, sometimes it helps. You have to have the right neighbors, right? Yeah, sometimes it definitely helped, and and you know we was always already then. I guess I don't, I'm not sure internationally, but locally, what at least we had a little bit of a name, you know, because I, you know, maybe not me, but Infernus had a bit name because of Gorgoroth and Ivor from Enslaved was involved, and Grim, or Eric, as I I prefer to call him, uh, the, the the late drummer, he was into Gorgoroth Immortal and stuff. So we had a little bit of fame you know, um, helping us maybe a little bit, you know, the name, the branding thing. Um, so yeah, that was that was basically it. And, it, and if, the first couple of months with Malicious Records was awesome. I remember he, he offered to pay, you know, buy us guitars and equipment. And I was like, what the fuck is, you know, where do you get all the money from? But but apparently that at that time, you know, releasing a black metal album was, was kind of a little bit of a gold rush for some people, you know. So. So we had a good budget, was able to pay the for studio and spend the time we needed. And you know, back then that was not, that was rare. You know, being able for a metal band in Bergen to go to a proper studio for you know whatever weeks to record and mix an album that was expensive as fuck back then. So so you know that was a big lift up or a, what can I say um, a help. Um, so it started out very good with malicious, but it doesn't didn't end too good though because he just disappeared I don't know that story but there was a lot of has been throughout the years a lot of um, illegal uh, illegal versions of the album and contractual things issues but we have sorted it now and we just released about a year ago I think now we released a reissue of the, the debut album which is like really spent a lot of time in my studio I remastered like for real not just a copy of a copy but I did uh, have a high-end studio mastering studio at home so I did uh, did um, uh, rip the the original mixes from from the original mixtapes and and did a proper remastering of the album and we collected a bunch of, of um, I collect a bunch of archive photos and uh, extra material and and even the lyrics which have people have been asking me for years and years you know I, I wanted to keep those secret but 
in the end of the end of the day, we um, what, what can I say? I, I kind of thought of releasing them. Actually, a reason why people ask me about that because you know the mysterious thing about the lyrics and stuff. But but I saw some you know comments and stuff on on the internet uh, that there was like some you know um, discussions and you know. Uh, somebody insinuating that we had some dodgy lyrics going, like like fascist lyrics or something like that, and that just okay, fuck that. I've I've always been very against that kind of uh, extreme uh, mentality or political views or whatever. So so I then I just wanted to puncture the whole uh, discussion to to actually release the lyrics and you know it's 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 folk metal. It's about mountains and nature and that's all. And, you know. No. Fitting the bill, so to say, right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so, so and, and and of course, I, I, you know, I, I'm, um, I've always, you know, been a guy that I, I want to be real about things. When I sell something, an album to people, I want to to make it, you know, worth their money in a sense. I, I just want, don't want to make a copy of a copy of a copy. You know, um, that's the easy way to do it, easy way to earn money. But I, I, I said to Century Media, they offered me to to re-release it when it was 25 years old. That. Yeah, maybe in the first first time they asked, and and but I, in in that case I want to do it properly. I want to invest in it and make an album which really um, has the value that people deserve if they actually going to buy it for a second time. So we made a kind of deluxe version with two LPs. We did a lot, uh, include a lot of ar archive photos. I the second LP or vinyl and the second CD in the in the CD box is like filled up with a lot of uh, rehearsal tapes, uh, rehearsal recordings. We also had, um, you know, back then when we recorded drums, bass and guitar, we did that live in the Gregal studio. Me and Infernus and Eric was actually playing that together. You know, the rhythm section, bass and guitars. So so I kind of added that as well to, to, to this bonus material. Uh, not, not really to make people kind of uh, get completely knocked out by the sound because the sound is not that good but I, I kind of wanted to give people some some insight in the musical evolution history of the band or, or as a testament of the band call it what it was I, I wanted to play with orbit cards therefore I kind of released everything that's connected everything all I have of all core ar archive photos lyrics yeah, and personal <coughs> personal things is is uh, included in that album. So it's it's ultimate album version though. Yeah, it's great to hear that you're not shying away from the old material. Um, and you, you even played uh, played a song uh, live last tour, right? You played Dorden, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. We we do that from time to time actually. Dorden song, but it seems to be the most popular song for that album. Um, and yeah. Maybe we should have done it this time as well, but you know, f <laughs> we have been around for so many years and so many albums that we have 45 minutes on this tour and that doesn't cover one song from each album, so we have to pick, you know. Yeah. So right now we want to focus a little bit on, on, on True North, of course, with three songs from that album, and uh, or two, oh. and uh, with the tries and stuff like that, so, so um, yeah, it is what it is. Yeah, we have to make some choices. Uh, since you uh, m mentioned Eric, uh, I believe he uh, he had left the band before he passed away. Is this is this right? Uh, on, on what terms did you did you part with him? There wasn't, to be quite honest with you, wasn't too good actually. I remember we were supposed to do um, a concert in Trondheim, which is north in Norway somewhere, um, and and when we were rehearsing to that concert. Um, he was like, just okay, this is it for me. We're going to do this concert, and then I'm quitting. Um, I, I, I still don't know what it, what really was going on at that time, to be quite honest with you. I, I didn't have any big problems with him. Actually, we drove together in my car several times to, to and from rehearsal place, and we talked about doing a new album and stuff like that. But there was, uh, I don't know, something going on. I, I you know, I, and I have to be a little bit private on this because he had some issues. Um, and I think that he was involved in some, some not too good habits so to speak. So, so um, I know a little bit more, of course, uh, the inside of the story, but I want to, you know, be a little bit... Um, yeah, you shouldn't disclose that yeah. on public radio, no, no. Yeah, it's, it's kind of, uh, keep it like that. But, but it was a sad story. His, 
you know, his life was, uh, he, he had, didn't have the easiest life, so to speak. He had a background, he had a family, uh, and there was a lot, a lot of issues, unfortunately. So, um, yeah. So, um, back to your releases. So, uh, you moved on to Century Media to release The Old Domain, which I thought, when I heard that f for the first time, it was a massive step, I think, yeah? A bit more ambitious, of course, or far more ambitious, right? What do you think of it today? I love it. I, I think that I still get the same chills uh, listening to it today that I got actually in studio in Hagen in Woodhouse. We we did. We, <laughs> that was the first time I was able to actually. We felt that we were you know kind of professional going to Germany, living at an apartment in Germany, and recording in uh, you know the famous at that time the famous Woodhouse studio and stuff like that was awesome. We didn't have that much time though, so we had to do everything very quick. I remember. It's a lot of flaws. There is a lot of you know things that should have been better and so on and so forth. But I remember we was doing, especially when we, me and Garen was doing the vocals and stuff, and we were supposed to do the vocals and one day off or something, and then we were supposed to do the mixing of the album. And I remember when when me and Chris sat uh, here doing the vocals and all this crazy stuff we were doing, and he had his paddles for the grim vocals. And I remember Siggy Bam was quite pissed because it sounded like shit, but we we enjoyed it. We you know we wanted to keep some of the Norwegian black metal feel to things, you know, and and, and rebellious ideas and sound wise as well. And uh, but I remember uh, I was sitting around listening to Garm doing his vocals, and all right, this is this is something. It might go wrong, badly wrong, uh, but it might also, you know, do something, make make a change in the scene somehow. Because I really felt that we did something new. We kind of broke out of the bubble. We kind of. Yeah, pushed everything. I mean, seriously, at that time we did, we added Hammond organ, for example. We, we added a lot of clean vocals as a refrains. At that time, very few band did so. But, you know, in hindsight, everybody's basically doing it now. So, so I, you know, I'm not taking all the honor for all, all the things that happened in this world. But, but I think that that album was for us and for, for some part of the scene, at least, a little bit um, groundbreaking in a sense, I would say. We challenge a lot of people, I think, but I think we did so in a positive way. Yeah. I, I would say that's even more the case for the archaic, uh, archaic course, um, which I think, well, I mean, I love that album. I nearly played it to death, I think. Yeah. Um, but this is also the album where I, for the first time, heard some kind of like, you know, black metal diehards who say, oh, no, no they're taking this too far, you know, they're wimping out and whatever. But it, to me, it was like, you know, yeah, you know, stepping onto new ground, really. Right? Yeah, and you know that that has been our core idea from the very start. I, you know, when I started, you know, making, I've always when making music. I, I've always had a very kind of visual relationship to music. I've always been very fascinated by movie soundtracks, for example, and um, philosophic, uh, philosophic, <laughs> symphonic music, uh, huge arrangement of stuff like that that makes kind of sonic landscapes and stuff like that. So for me, music has always been very in a weird way, um, visual. Um, not by videos production or pictures or anything like that, but, but music to me is a kind of, I get a lot of visual experience from music. When I listen to Big Floyd, for example, I get a lot of kind of shapes and <laughs> colors in my head and stuff like that. It, it, you know, ev each and every Pink Floyd song has a shape and a structure and a color in my head. And, and that's something, you know, I, I, I um, kind of always had a notion, this notion with my own music. I wanted to try to do the same thing as bands, f as, as from Pink Floyd does for me. You know, when I listen to Pink Floyd, that that brings something into my life or my, my emotional life that nothing else do in this world. I might take drugs, I might be drunk, I might be, you know, whatever, but it doesn't give me the same thing as Pink Floyd gives me. Um, and that was an idea I had with uh, with my band in the very early days. I wanted to, you know, do something musically that that adds to the whole thing, adds to the world, adds to the feeling. You know, not just something that jumps into the flow, or the stream of everything. If you get my point. So, I had a very kind of sharp sharp idea even back then about making my own musical universe in a sense. If I've succeed or not, I I don't know. But but you know that has at least been my intention, and also doing that. 
I felt a very kind of, uh, my father was kind of very kind of outspoken free thinker back then, a hippie and all that. So I also had this mentality that I, I you know, I want uh, a, um, a free-minded approach to my music. I don't want it to be any borders. I don't want to be to be any, you know, I want to do musically whatever I want to do. Even if I don't do jazz tomorrow or blues in a couple of days, probably not going to happen. But I, I, I just need to have the feeling that I can do that, that, that I'm... I, free to do whatever I want musically. To me that is a very important. So therefore I think that the whole push behind the band, the whole idea behind the, the philosophy behind the band has, has been to always always take a step further, always push the boundaries a little bit, challenge myself ourselves musically, uh, do something that is a bit you know on the edge maybe sometimes but hopefully it turns out to be on a good side of things you know. Um, so that's, I guess that's just something with the mentality behind the band. I've, I've tried to, you know, do. If I suc succeed or not, I don't know. But but that, that's at least my basic ideas. Is it difficult sometimes to get everyone on the same track and be behind your your visions, so to say? It might sound complicated, but no, I think you know it's 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 um, it's almost like you know I, I would say at this at this point in time uh, you know the band the whole thing that Borknagar is these days it's so much more than just me in a sense and and you know the people that we have of course a couple of new, new musicians that we celebrated a couple of days ago four years in the band so they are pretty young but me and Simon me and Lars have worked for a long time and I even though it's so complicated, I think it's it's very somehow quite easy to um, acclimate into the band in a, in a way if you understand the basic ideas. And also, I'm a talker, so I talk probably <laughs> their heads off about my musical ideas and principles and whatnot, you know. But but now it's 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 I feel I've always felt that it's it's that's something that just kind of happens naturally. Uh, it kind of just, uh, when we find the right musicians, we talk, of course, we have our, like with a new, when you uh, stand and a new drummer, uh, not new anymore though, but but like four years ago, we had a, you know, um, session with them meeting in Oslo and all that. And, and uh, they got it pretty damn good in the first, I mean, remember we had a first rehearsal together and I had to ask Justen, the new guitarist, or maybe the new guitarist. <clears throat> Usain, how, how, how did you play that riff? <laughs> oh, thank you. <laughs> so, you know, they, they are really skilled musicians and I did really spent a lot of work getting into the listening to music, trying to understand the music and all that. So that has been actually quite smooth, to be honest. So uh, after the RK course, you released uh, Quintess Quintessence and uh, Empiricism, which for me go a little bit hand in hand, probably because I picked them up pretty much at the same time. Yeah. Um, so what, what's your take on those two albums? Yeah, Quintessence was um, was a very, <laughs> in, in, I would, what can I say, um, was a very intense time, but in a different way. I remember. I spent a lot of time in Oslo. Um, we got a new drummer then, yeah, uh, Oscar Mikkelsen from uh, from Oslo, from Sp Spiral Architect and stuff. So there was a lot of change to the band at that time, and we also kind of decided to go for this Woodhouse, no, Abbey Studio in Sweden, Peter Takren, and and it was cool. Um, I remember after uh, our K course, we wanted to. To kind of sharpen the knives a little bit more, to make a little bit more metal impact, to make you know a little bit more hard hitting in a sense. Uh, we didn't want to repeat ourselves. Uh, we didn't want to do our K course number two, so to speak. So, guess that's what we did. We rehearsed a lot in Oslo. I remember at that time, I, as, a, as a band, we rehearsed damn a lot. And and then we. So I think that the difference, the main difference between quintessence and empiricism is roughly the fact that those songs were written pretty much in the same time span. You know, when, when we were rehearsing Quintessence, I was already done writing Quint, uh, Empiricism. But we did go to two different, very different studios with those albums. Peter doing Quintessence album and turned out the way he did. I think it sounds awesome and I would maybe do some remastering at some point of that. But 
but then we did and then we did quint no um, empiricism uh, yeah the year after or something in a Norwegian studio and uh, both turned out great I would say uh, but very different also but still the same it, it's and I, I kind of love that a little bit black and white relationship between those two albums because Quintessence sounds completely different in a sense than Empiricism but they are still linked musically but you know they are working on different I don't know <laughs> almost frequency as an, at some point yeah I have to spin them again now that you say this is, was all kind of like composed pretty much t together. Yeah. Maybe that's the link that I have. Maybe I, th I always thought, okay, it's probably because I picked them up pretty much together. Yeah, but yeah, okay. Yeah. And, and at that time, I was actually hyper uh, pro productive. I, I remember at that time, I had like three, four albums written at all times. So I still have a couple of albums li lying home that I've never done anything, but actually from that time, <laughs> I have at least two albums that I've never, you know, it's in my shelf. But they, you would consider them to be kind of like ready albums, right? Or it's, it's not like a collection of songs. Yeah, the unpublished stuff that you're just referring to. You, yeah. you would really think those, those could be Bognaga albums at some point or... Yeah, but all, yeah, yeah, definitely, as, as a skeleton, as a, as, as a framework. But of course, we, we spend also, it's important to note, I, I've, you know, I've read, I've write a lot of the songs. I, I do the, the framework, the gray and, you know, the scratch, uh, sketches, so to speak. But you know, the guys always helped me to colorize and produce the album. So there is, you know, the process for me to write a song is quite, to be quite honest, quite swift. I can write a song in, in a few hours, if, that, if, if, you know, sometimes, other times, two weeks, depends. But what really takes time and maybe more and more so over the years is that the, the, the production afterwards. To, you know, to produce everything together, glue everything together as an album, lyrically speaking, production-wise, what which song first and you know third and you know all that stuff. So so we spend a lot of time also you know producing the album. Um, so it's it's a kind of three-step process for us. You know I do my sketches and then we bring it over to the whole band and everybody kind of get into the music and learn the songs and add some things and we are kind of playing around with ideas and stuff like that and then we have the third that we actually do record it um, yeah like planned you know so let's move on to the next album which yeah. which was epic yeah uh, it probably still is right I mean the, the title is pretty much in your face a uh, very very clear statement as well yeah I, I guess this was intentional at the time right yeah, I mean, and, and to, to be quite honest, that has it throughout my career. Just that those years was my most weird years in so many ways, um, and also for the band. I think you know we 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 both at that time it was basically just me and Lars and Oscar and Wintersog doing vocals. Um, thing was, I'm in in my private life. I got my first child, for example. Uh, I, you know, I moved, uh, got a new house, and I got uh, a decent job, and I, you know, I finished some education. So, at that time, I was, I wasn't, to be quite honest with you, I wasn't 100% into the music at that time. I was a little bit on, on, on the fence about everything. Um, but we had, you know, agreement to do the album contractually and all that stuff. So, we, you know, I, we kind of continued working and and. I remember we just felt that okay let's just blow this balloon up up as much as we can just let's do all of everything <laughs> you know <laughs> and and I, I don't remember why but we, we we just did so and I think you know that album is the most in one way ambitious is not the right word but m maybe the most I don't you know philosophic uh, abstract uh, waste amount of arrangement, huge arrangement. Um, so it was a quite crazy album in so many ways. Um, maybe we didn't know really where to go. Maybe I was a little bit unfocused. To be honest, I think so. I was a bit unfocused at that time. I wasn't like, to, yeah, let's do an album, but you know, I have kids at home. I need to, you know. So, so to me, at that time, to be quite honest, music was a bit secondary to me because of my life situation. And the same goes for the other guys. So we, we just did it, but uh, <laughs> it was a crazy time. Um, looking back at that album, I think that's the album I... Um, there was a lot that could be, the, be a little bit different. And uh, 
that maybe that's the album I like the least of what we have done throughout the years. To be quite honest with you, uh, but it's still a cool album, I think. And it's it's so massive, it's so huge, it's so everything um, that it kind of turned out cool that way. But um, then came the idea about Origin, the album after. I got this very kind of fe strong feeling about okay, Eastern, we need to bring this down back to earth. Uh, so we did our <laughs> or Origin, which was our acoustic album, and you know the very first riffs or ar arrangements I made for Bokna was acoustic. That was my basic idea was to make acoustic project back in '96 or very acoustic based project. So at we kind of just decided. I remember Sentry Media was like, hey, you know, you shouldn't do that. It's commercial suicide and hey-ho. I was like, okay, what the fuck? I'm going to do this. And we did. And I had many journalists calling me up. You know, I'm a metalhead, so I don't like this. But let's do an interview. <laughs> All right? <laughs> I mean, that's kind of like weird because I don't think that I've ever read a negative review about that album. So my, my question actually would have been, maybe the media is not open enough with the criticism um, if they really don't like it so, so, so maybe I don't know like how, how did your maybe closer circle of friends or family react to that I mean did, did they enjoy it or were they also more like ah yeah you should do this <laughs> quite honest I don't remember I think you know we was we was quite at that time was quite satisfied doing it ourselves uh, doing that kind of album because we got involved some Especially one flute flute guy from Norway that is really kind of national icon and stuff like that. So for us, locally, it was quite a cool thing to do. I remember we had some local news doing interviews with me and stuff, and you know, it was a little, a little bit cool that the metal band did a you know a folk acoustic album and all that stuff. Um, but yeah, and I remember we got a lot of. I remember we got some some world music magazines that all of a sudden started to write about. It. I did interviews with a lot of magazines that I'd never, you know, that was not usual, you know, bunch of interviews do upon a release, you know. So it definitely, you know, it kind of. <laughs> what can I say? It was a little bit uh, off the tracks, doing something different, um, and it was. To me, it was almost like it felt necessary to do it in order to kind of uh, just break out, do something else, derail, you know, do an entirely acoustic album. I remember it was really tough making that album because, you know, making a acoustic-based album with rhythm section and bass, you know, everything has to be really tight because otherwise it sounds like a, you know, crazy madness. So it's a lot of work to make that happen, uh, album happen, but... Um, it was it was cool times, weird times, and and uh, but I, I I had this very strong uh, notion that I had to do this. I, I just had to do an acoustic album, even if nobody listened to it. Um, and I think actually that was how it started. I wrote a lot of acoustic songs. I, again, I have one more of that that kind of album written, um, and we picked out these songs and all that. Um, uh, I, I just as, as a musician, and I think that you know. If you're a band in the long run, in order to survive musically, uh, you have to sometimes do something different. You can't eat chocolate all the time. You can't eat beef all the time. You have sometimes you have to, you know, uh, do something completely different. And that that's basically what we did with uh, with the origin, I would say. Um, and yeah, it's a, I think it's a cool album. I think it's, I'm, I'm proud we did it actually. Good. So uh, next up was uh, Universal, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah, and I guess Universal was the album we wanted, you know, to get a little bit back on track. Obviously, uh, um, you know, my kids was a little bit grower, you know, uh, older, older and stuff, and we was it, things started to become easier as you know, life in general started to become easier. And we we signed a deal. We, we finished a deal with Central Media, and we did our, our record deal with Indie Recordings in Norway, and. We thought that was a good idea in the, in the beginning and all that stuff, and it started out really good. Um, did Universal. Um, I think it turned out pretty damn cool. I'm not too happy about, about the production, to be quite honest. Um, and also, uh, Universal album and, um, and um, the Urd album is pretty much written in the same time. So, so um, looking back at it now, I was kind of happy with the Universal album. I wasn't too happy about the release by any recordings because 
you know, we kind of realized after a while that shit, we have been on central media for for so many years. And and, uh, and when uh, Universal came out, we got a lot of uh, feedback from fans. They wasn't able to get hold of the records, the distribution, distribution failed and all that. So we, we kind of realized that, okay, we did something not too good here. Um, so we decided to split with, you know, uh, with the indie recordings and, and uh, go back to Central Media then. But, but uh, again, Universal and the album Urd was written, written pretty much over the same uh, time frame. Uh, and all that also you see different. We did this uh, Universal in a Norwegian studio. And uh, I think we, during the process of that album, kind of realized, okay, shit, we have to, we have to get some, somebody else to do this. We get, you know, another studio, another producer, something had to happen because we felt that we kind of was working in circles uh, production-wise. It was a good friend of mine, uh, Top Room Studio in Norway, where he's a brilliant engineer and all that, but we felt that, okay, now we are kind of repeating ourselves too much production-wise. Unfortunately, that album suffers a little bit from that, I think, but um, yeah, so is life. Then we did Urd, which we kind of just decided, okay, let's go to the best thing in the world. What's that? Fascination Street Studio. <laughs> we did. And I think that album turned out fantastic. Um, so much better in so many ways. And the music comes, I don't know, it, it, everything fits together so much better, uh, I would say. The albums run smooth, it's cool songs, the production is awesome. And, and um, I love the album, I love that album, I really dig it. Um, but it's kind of weird because I think that is ten times better than Universal. But the songs was pre written pretty much yeah. in the same. So that's a production thing. And then actually, I, actually at that time I was getting more and more into producing myself. I've always been, you know, kind of producing myself because I've I've never let everybody or anybody just do my things. I've always been sitting on the with the mixing table together with the guy mixing the album. No, 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 you know. <laughs> watching what he's doing but and, and, and that has been my frustration a little bit through the years that um, I truly believe in honest music in, in, in the idea that when I make music I want to make the distance between me and the listener as short as possible uh, I mean in this world and especially these days you can overproduce you can produce you can make some you know Photoshop Cubase whatever you can you can design everything from here to whatever you know but I, 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 I want to keep my music authentic what I do what I intend to do with my music is something I would would like to you know project to the listener in the the most truthful way if you get my point so for me the frustration back in the day was always that I had a vision about my music my the production how it should sound how it should impact you emotionally but not always we, we was able to achieve that because of you know different engineers studio facilities or whatnot you know time in studio so with with Urd, I, I really got into this producing stuff myself thing. I recorded much more in studio. I bought some equipment in the early days and stuff. By now I have a high end, high professional studio. But but that's what's you know the reason why I started all this. So so with Urd, we started to record everything ourselves. Uh, actually making proper demos, pre-production before hitting the studio and stuff like that. So so I think Urd for for me or for us was a bit of a new dawn in a sense of, of we, we, we got a, lo a lot more control over the production or what we did and, and um, from that album Urd and Winter Tries and now the latest True North it's, it's pretty much done uh, yeah pretty much the same way as uh, yeah the same studio the same I recorded everything but the drums ourselves the drums are always recorded in a professional studio of course but so, I mean, for Urd, I have to say, uh, when I listened to that, I noticed something had changed. Because that album was, to me, more immediate and it, it really sucked me in. Whereas the pre predecessors, well, I listened to them, but they didn't have the, the same appeal, let's say, as the, let's say, like, you know, the first three albums that we spoke about, where, where you just notice, okay, there's a band on a roll that is discovering stuff and it's, you know, breaking new ground and so on. I, I didn't have that for, for those in, uh, albums in the middle. But then with Earth, something has, had changed really, right? 
And uh, I think the same goes, yeah, as you mentioned, for, for the last two now, yeah? Um, yeah, I, th I, we, I think by Erd we found our kind of our uh, sweet spot in terms of production, how to do things properly, how to how to master art in a way. Uh, and, and then I'm not talking about, you know, just writing songs, but also producing things, because we have even the latest True North, of course, yes, Burger and have, have mixed it for us, but, you know, we have produced it or pretty much ourselves. I mean... I quite recently listened to some of the pre-production of True North and at, 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 in two seconds I was like, is this the album or is this the pre-production? Because it sounds pretty damn like. So I, I think that we, at, at, with Urd, kind of, we, we got to that point in our career where we kind of got the complete control of what we are doing musically and production-wise uh, in a different, entirely different way than the, the albums before. So, so that's exciting for me, and we're gonna push it even more with True North and after True North, and yeah. Let's touch on Winter Thrice for a second then as well. Uh, for, for me, that album is massive. I really love it, and I think it's also, you know, the way it was promoted with the video clip for Winter Thrice. For me, that was, yeah, the song itself was a song that I could use to introduce other people that not necessarily listen to metal too much to the band because it's visually so captivating it's it's kind of like insane you know with all the nature stuff there um, like who, who yeah who came up with that idea was there like a storyboard written for that that, that you did, did you have a vision to do it like this because it contrasts so nicely with you guys sitting in a nice warm cabin yeah no, no I mean we it, you know it's a kind of a story because winter tries it, it, it was almost like the stars was at the line at that point because I was writing uh, actually, the song Winter Tries was a song that we was I was planning to just toss away, not use for for the album. Uh, but but then I don't remember some of the guys who said, "Yeah, maybe that's a cool thing." And then I was kind of kind of coincidence. I was looking at an old picture at home, some private pictures. And you know, back in the day when we took pictures, you all very often got a date on, on in the cover a corner of the uh, of the of the picture. And I kind of noted there was a picture of me and Garb the first time we met in in in. Um, in Bergen to do the record, uh, do the vocals for the first album, and it was pretty much that on the same date, just 20 years before, like the same month, almost the same date, and everything. So I sent him a message, you know, to, to Garm, hey you, I have a song that it's a little bit odd, and I would kind of was thinking about just tossing it, but maybe we could do something on this one, you know. So in the end of the day, long story, I it took took a while before he answered because I was like, ah, he's not up for it. But then he called me after a few hours and like, yeah, sure, I'm just on my way to the cabin or something like that. But yeah, sure, let's do this. But send me a few more songs and stuff. Yeah, sure. So I sent him a three or four songs or something, uh, especially the Winter Tri song and the lyrics and everything. And, and uh, he went to the studio and did some demoing and stuff. And it was like just blew my head off, so to speak, especially the Winter, Winter Tri song. Um, and of course, I agreed to do all this. And then we started to talk about, yeah, you know, if we're gonna do a video, and it was also the 10th album, so my point is that it was like the perfect moment for everything for us to, you know, do one song with all the vocalists. It's like 20 years and the 10th, 10th album, and it's it exactly, you know, it's a little bit, you know, whatever, symbolic thing over it. And then we, we kind of, when we uh, we did, uh, uh, yeah, uh, with the tries, it's, it's always this, this, you know, labels want you to do some promo videos and videos and stuff. And we thought that, yeah, maybe we should do, for the first, you know, we have this song, it's an awesome song. Let's do a proper video, let's spend some money on this one. And, and uh, by coincidence, I think we had some contacts at this museum in Horten. That was, I think, and I'm not sure it was before this Midgasblut festival, you know, in, in Norway. But we were actually talking with those guys and we kind of got a little bit curious about the whole building. So we kind of, yeah, it looks cool. Maybe we should do something with this. So we basically hired a f uh, film team or crew of two guys filming us, fired up the, the fire in, inside this building. It's an old Viking kind of replica of a Viking, you know, uh, house or whatever. We basically sit down. We didn't have any new, you know, we don't have any amps here. It maybe sounds weird. I am here with my guitar without any amps and there's a drum kit, but you know, the guys is just sitting in chairs. It was a bit odd, you know, the whole thing, but let's f fuck it. Let's just do it. And, and uh, we did kind of record a lot of scenes there with, with of course, the, the music in, in the background and stuff. And, 
And then we kind of just talked that we wanted this contrast thing going because that's important in my my almost always you know this yin and yang or winter and summer thing. So so uh, so we t- I talked with the producers. Maybe we should you know uh, get some you know big mountain things and some some uh, what's called this um, drones drone filming and stuff. Uh, and at that time, you know, drones were still a pretty new thing. And then those guys, yeah, sure, we got to go, go to the cabin this, this, in this next weekend. And I have a drone with a camera and stuff like this. They're going to shoot some pictures there and we're going to, you know, edit together and stuff. That's basically the story about it. We didn't... We, we kind of just did something and it turned out like that. We didn't have any storyline. But the, the only conceptual idea we had, we wanted to have all the vocalists in the video. And we wanted to have this warmth inside versus the outside cold wasteland, you know, the contrast of it. And it worked pretty good. It works a treat, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, I mean, it's a similar, similar case maybe with the video for, uh, for Voices that you did for the current album. Yeah. Because you have this, you know, lady in white in the water and the lady in black in the, in, in the ice cold yeah. outside, yeah, right? Yeah yeah. yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's always. You know, I think, you know, that's life. I mean, and, and again, always, I've always had this idea about real true music whatever that is but in my mind you know that is honest music and uh, you know I, it doesn't work to pretend to be i'm not a, i've never seen myself as an entertainer i have to be myself i wear pretty much the same clothes on stage and off stage i have never used any coat paint and because i have this very strong notion that music should be real honest uh, and honest music the really good music in my opinion you know it comes that, that is the music that is able to mirror the life in all its facets. All, you know, the sorrow, the happiness, the, the brutal times, the good times. All these facets of life, you know. Um, and, and so this contrast thing, this play, uh, yeah, all these uh, ups and downs in life has always been very important in my, my music. Okay. So as a conclusion, I will command our listeners to buy all of your albums. Right, and uh, maybe, maybe we proceed to the last question for tonight. The show is called What's Metal? Yeah. What do you think is metal? Yeah, can you describe it? Is there a definition for it maybe from your point of view? Oh man, I should have a little bit of uh, uh, thinking about this. Uh, what is metal? To me, metal, in all honesty, is the most um, real music in my life. Uh, it it's holds all the facets of life, it holds the beauty of life, it holds the brutality of life, it holds the power of life, but it also, you know, holds a lot of, you know, darkness and stuff. So, to me, it's, it's, it's the ultimate expression of, of life. That's a very profound ending to the interview. Thanks a lot for talking to us. Okay, thank you, man.